Hey there, Business of Unicorns podcast listeners. This is Mark, and I'm here to tell you about an awesome free resource on businessforunicorns.com. If you ever find yourself feeling frustrated with your training gym, because you know that there are all sorts of things you could work on, but you're not really sure how to prioritize, you don't know what's the most important thing to work on or, or what order you should be tacking your, your priorities, well, now is the time to go to businessforunicorns.com, click the button, and fill out our free self-assessment. With the Ultimate Training Gym Owner Report Card, you will gain immediate clarity on just where to be focusing your attention to create more positive impact on your community, to drive more revenue and take home income, and to do it all with less stress and more peace of mind. So go to businessofunicorns.com, click the button, fill out that free self-assessment, and start building a business and life you love today. Hello, fitness business nerds. Welcome to another episode of the Business for Unicorns podcast. And today I'm bringing you another roundtable conversation with two of our Unicorn Society members, uh, Anthony and Danny Two Guns. Uh, and I'm so excited to bring them to the, to the table in a moment, but I wanted to start by just framing up this conversation. So a lot on this podcast, we talk about marketing. And we talk about all the strategies and ways you can do great marketing. Uh, and these are really important conversations. But today I wanted to change the angle of the conversation just a little bit and focus on how you organize all of those efforts. You know, what are all the ways that you get started in understanding how you as an organization or you as a gym are going to market yourselves? And then how do you organize all of those efforts over time as your team grows, uh, as there's more and more to do, or there's more and more social media platforms every day? <laughs> and so I wanted to focus today's conversation on how do you organize all your marketing efforts on social media and otherwise? And so I brought Anthony and Danny here today to have that conversation. And I'm so excited because I think this is a, a part of this process that we haven't talked about a ton on this podcast. And I'm excited to dump, jump in today. So let's welcome to the stage. What's up, Anthony? Hey, Danny Two Guns. How are you, my friends? Very good. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, let's let's dive in with a quick introduction. <clears throat> so I want to I want to uh, start with you, Danny Two Guns. I would love for you to just say a little bit about who the heck are you? What's your gym? Where are you in the world? And that's just like one thing you're like stoked about for 2022. I'll get to the stoked about. So Danny Two Guns, Erie, Pennsylvania, owner of Two Guns Training Systems, a brick and mortar hybrid training facility and the owner of the Fitness Nerd Academy, which is a marketing agency and coaching services resource for fitness professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I'm really stoked about in 2022, is, I guess, is the never ending aspiration of what we could almost describe as a return to normalcy, mm -hmm. um, though I am not holding my breath. <laughs> the, the elusive dream is it is right now for everyone. Um, amazing, thanks for being here Two Guns. Uh, how about you, Anthony? Uh, Anthony Mercurio uh, from Utica, New York, which is, isn't far from Erie, Pennsylvania. It's just down one road, I think. We can get from Syracuse yep, to Erie yep. and just shoot down there. Um, I own Prime Movement and Performance Brick and Mortar Place and uh, large strength and conditioning facility. And the um, thing that I'm stoked about, about moving, I think, similar to Danny, uh, is this kind of we're getting closer and closer to this return to normalcy. And mm -hmm. uh, for our type of uh, business, it's it's a very good sign for us. Very good sign for us to get back to, you know, doing things how we want to be able to do them and, and keep moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, my friends. It's so funny. I feel like uh, I won't go down this rabbit hole too far, but I feel like in business, I want to get back to normal because for training gym owners like all of us, I want people to feel comfortable coming back into gyms. I want there to be a routine in people's lives again. <laughs> and I want our, you know, our clubhouse at MFF to be bustling and bursting at the seams like it was before COVID. And in my personal life, I don't want to go back to normal. Is that weird? <laughs> is, that, is that okay to say? <clears throat> like, I really truly want a new normal. Um, and, you know, and I'm still figuring out what, what I want that to look like, but I think it's an exciting opportunity. So I wanted to like, yes, and both of you, like, yes, I want some normalcy for our businesses. And for my own life, I want to, I want to keep it dangerous. You know, yeah. I want to keep mixing it up. <laughs> um, want to keep all the pros and get rid of the cons. You know, it's yeah. there. Yeah, come on. Come on. That's exactly it. All right. Well, let's talk about organizing our marketing marketing efforts. I'm going to start with you two guns. And the first question is for people listening, how do you think about kind of organizing your market marketing efforts from like a big picture? Like what are the foundational elements you need to have at your fingertips as a gym owner before you dive in to start to do any good marketing? What information, materials, tools, what do you need when you 
first start to organize your marketing uh, efforts? Yeah, I think the, the way I like to describe it initially is there's this overarching framework and then there's three bigger pillars. The overarching framework comes from uh, John Jance. He wrote uh, The Ultimate Marketing Engine. And the quote of that is the ultimate marketing engine is a successful customer. And in, in that it, it's both the things, cause we talk about referrals all the time, but a successful customer, it drives, you get referrals, you get the content, you get all the things and it kind of makes this ecosystem we can operate in mm -hmm. that is based around having successful customers. You know, you're having a good service because they're getting results and it's this kind of snowball effect that goes into it. And those three things, I think uh, we have to talk about the avatar. Um, even though it tends to be the thing where people's eyes glaze over because people always talk about the avatar. Um, but just because <laughs> people always talk about it doesn't mean they do it well, right? Yep. So we have the avatar, we have brand, both identity, presence, you know, style guide type stuff. And then we have content creation because that ends up being the foundation for our actual tactics. Um, yep. And then everything else kind of falls around those three. Every conversation we have after that falls around those three. Got it. That's. I think it's a great summary, and we can. We're, we'll. We will for sure dive into each of those. But just to repeat for our listeners, Denny mentioned kind of client avatar, clarifying who that is. One of the three pillars for sure. Um, brand, you know, who you are and how you represent yourself, the reputation you create for yourself out in the world. Um, and then the third one is content, right? The kind of things you put out to get people to know you. That's, those are three great pillars. Uh, how about you, Anthony? Do you have anything? Anything you would add to that, or anything that? Is, you think is important that's outside of those three? Well, I think in terms of brand, I think one thing that, that sticks out too, especially in the training space, because the, there's so many different fitness styles and things mm. that are out in our space right now, whether that's at home stuff or, you know, you have like powerlifting gyms or CrossFit gyms or uh, semi-private gyms. So you have a lot of different types of things there. So inside of that brand, I think having a lot of clarity on like what type of of fitness offerings that you have and have clarity on your training systems that are around there that allow you to touch upon and get to that avatar client and build that brand around that. Yeah, I think you're right. It's so important. I mean, clearly the training experience is, is what we're selling. Um, and so, you know, getting clear on that is, is absolutely kind of a core component of figuring out what your brand is, is how yeah. am I going to train people and get them results? Yeah. Anything else, any other tools or um, piece of information that you, you would think about gathering as you, as you start creating some uh, marketing materials? I, I think uh, one of the things that we we didn't touch upon at all is like having some sort of technological skills. Mm. <laughs> I mean, everything is, is in your fingertips now. And if you can't, you know, navigate with your phone, whether through Canva or have some sort of tech savvy, it's going to be very difficult to get your message out there as clear as you want and as, as nice and aesthetically pleasing as you want to. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that one up, Anthony, because I find that's really a barrier to a lot of people I talk to is they feel like they don't have the right tools or they have the tools that someone told they told them they should be using some piece of software yeah. or in some cases, hardware for making content. And they just don't know how to freaking use it. <laughs> it really stops them dead in their tracks when it's something could be something as simple as like, I don't know how to actually build a Facebook ad, or I can't find a camera that helps us record in our low lighting setting, right? Like there's so many yeah. just technical barriers to, to marketing for people these days. And so I think it's a really good one to add to our, maybe we'll consider that a fourth pillar is yeah. like your technological tools. Um, yeah, let's just start with the first one. So I think avatar, we can all agree, is kind of huge, right? It's kind kind of the whole the whole thing. So how do you how do you go about crafting an avatar that actually is useful? Start with you two guns. Um, I think the when we look at the avatar, there's there's four pieces that are that are in pairs. So the, the first because it was popularized like the, the Homer Simpson game, like you have to say more qualities or attributes about your potential client than you can about Homer Simpson. And that, that's true to a point, right? But at some point, it doesn't matter what Homer's dog's name is or, you know, it's, what's his best friend's name. Like there's, we get to these granular details that don't actually, that aren't actually helpful, but the sentiment is true, but you can't right. stop there, right? You have to know demographical details and random, you know, demographic bits of data about your person, but you need to know about the person themselves. So the, the two pairs, one is the goals and the values. The goals are what do you, what does your client want to accomplish? The the values is the yes end to that, which is the values are why are those goals important to that person, right? The goal mm -hmm. is the thing, but the values are why that is important. And the other pair are challenges and pain points. 
challenges are the logistical issues that are preventing the person from getting to where they want to be. And the pain points are the yes and to that, which is the pain points are the costs that the challenges arise. So the challenges are the logistical details. Um, I don't have time where the pain point is probably something more like they're feeling like they're missing out on their kids' lives because they're on the sidelines and they can't actually participate in the things they want to participate in. So with, mm. with that, we look at the really diving deep on the values and the pain points for your potential client is one of the best bang for your buck things you can do for your marketing, for your gym um, in general, but also to get really, really clear on that avatar because all the things we're going to be doing in marketing are really dependent on those, whether it's coming from the positive end or the quote unquote negative end. Yeah. Where do you, where do you see people mess this up the most frequently? Um, not doing any of those, right? But <laughs> once, once we actually get to it, um, yeah. they, they tend to be fairly clear on the goals and the challenges and mm -hmm. not as clear on the values and the pain points. And the, the point really of the goals and the challenges are to get to the values and the pain points. So when mm -hmm. I'm working with people on their marketing, nine times out of 10, they're going through this avatar stuff. And the first bit of feedback is you need to spend more time and get clearer on the values and the pain points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Like what are the yeah. costs of not getting to where they want to be? And yeah. There's a lot to that. Yeah, for sure. I think you know, another phrase for listeners to think about is, you know, what's at stake for your avatar? Right. Absolutely. What's it, what's the what's what's the cost of action or what's the cost of inaction in their lives when it comes to working on their their health, their wellness? So I think that it's a great it's a great overview of an avatar exercise, Danny. I think if even if our listeners just wrote down those those six areas and started there, that's a great template for an avatar. Anthony, how how do you answer all those questions? You know, what's what's been your approach to like deciding who is your avatar going to be and knowing all of that about them? Well, I think we we kind of reverse engineered it, right? Mm -hmm. Because we were in business, which many of us are. When when we get into business, we don't always have all these tools at our disposal um, for marketing and different things. So we were looking at kind of who are, you know, like most positive, uh, I guess, our, our favorite clients that we had that were coming through the door every day and like yep. what what characteristics, what were their values, where were they going, what were they doing? And we kind of reverse engineered it that way as opposed to because we already had a lot of great people in our facility and people that we wanted more like right i want more of this type of person so what is that person doing like what about them is kind of has that positive contagiousness to them that we want to have more of those people here and then we just kind of had conversations with them and kind of like know start get to know them and you start reverse engineering who that ideal avatar client might look like yeah. Well said, my friend. I think that's exactly it. I mean, we all have favorites. Let's be honest. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so when you can reverse engineer, like, this is my ideal client. If I could work with 20 of this person, if I could work with 100 of this person, I'd be so stoked to come to work every day. Cool. Figure that out. Um, I also say to people, even if you have like, you know, your three or top five favorite clients, um, take them all to lunch, buy them all coffee and ask them all the same questions that Danny just mentioned. <laughs> right. And then, you know, you can, you can create your own kind of Frankenstein avatar based on multiple people. Um, um, the, let me ask this to both of you, um, because one of the biggest pieces of kind of pushback I get when I talk to, you know, Unicorn Society members or other coaching clients about creating an avatar. The first thing that so many people say to me is, but I don't serve just one kind of person. I'm for everyone. Can we make five avatars? Can I have 10 avatars? Um, and so how, how do you respond to that? I'll start with you, Danny. I, I think it, it kind of echoes what Anthony was saying, where we look at the people we enjoy and people tend to, first thing they say is, well, I enjoy working with a lot of types and kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And what, what I'll say to that is, okay, start with, the, we all have the clients we didn't like, right? The ones that flat out had uh, egregious faults <laughs> on our boundaries and the ones who have like little things. So we start by assessing the things and qualities that we don't want. Mm -hmm. And then that starts to let us chunk down the things we do want. So that's, and that's where like the brand thing kind of ties in where sometimes people talk about the people they work with and the avatars it's more of a brand identity piece where yeah. most people, it's not actually five, seven or 10 specific avatars they like to work with. It tends to be one or two, maybe three of which have different qualities that then overlap. 
Um, sure. But I tell people if, if they're saying that they have more than three, it usually is just an exercise of chunking down those things um, and not thinking that like the qualities you don't like are unique to each one. It's just there, there are things you don't like that are universal and then chunk yeah. down from there. Yeah, well said. I mean, what about you, Anthony? How would you respond to someone who's like, yeah, I can't have one avatar. We serve a million people. <laughs> Looks like you have some company. <laughs> yeah, my, my daughter had to come today, so I had to hang out with her. Again. Shh, one second. <laughs> she gets to be, a, is this her first podcast? Yeah, this is her first. Well, we play with the podcast stuff sometimes. <laughs> she was, we're, we're, we're working on it. We're working on it. That's I almost um, had my son with me, so we could add a party. Yeah, we could add a big party, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, well, my one thing is, uh, I would agree with Danny. I think two to three would be max. I mm -hmm. think you, you can do one thing really well. And then as you start getting, breaking that down and, and muddying the waters, as we talked about before, like you start getting people that are less desirable, that fit your core values and fit the things you're trying to do. So I think once you start trying to spread that and like, like, Hey, I can work with everybody. Right? I like working with everybody. I think when you're the newer you are as a, as an organization and you're trying to just kind of build. I think, yeah, I think, and as you keep going, you got to kind of get more niche mm -hmm. down as you can, you know, build those client help, those client profiles, because you may not be able to find that ideal client right away. Yeah. Um, so I think as you get going, I think that's a, a, a good way to start like condensing it as you get going. And then like Danny was saying, you, you know, I'm a physical education teacher also. And one of the things that a teacher told me a long time ago is like, when you're in a classroom, there's like the things that bug you the most when you set your rules. And like, those are the people, I guess, in a, in, a, in this setting that you don't want, like those things that really bug you the most. Those are the things we can cut out of that ideal avatar. We like don't want people who are, are do these three to five things. And it might cut those lists down that, you know, that, that 10 people to five or seven or three, you know, mm -hmm. as you get down more and more. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's really well said. And I love the idea that both of you are articulating here, like starting with the things you don't like and working, you know, finding what the, what the flip side of that coin is. I think one of the things that, one of the concerns that's kind of at the heart of that question of, can I have more avatars is some people think that by defining an avatar, they're being exclusionary. That if I have one avatar, that means no one else that doesn't fit this avatar is welcome, right? That I don't have to turn away all these other people. And I, I find it hard time, hard to articulate to them that no, the purpose of an avatar is not to close the door on everyone else, right? It's to focus your marketing efforts and energy. We have limited resources, limited time, limited money, <laughs> limited capacity to put, put information and content out in the world and attract people. So we just want to use the best bait possible to make sure we're catching the right kind of fish. It doesn't mean other things that wind up on the hook won't be great, right? doesn't mean you can't let other people in who don't exactly fit that avatar. Or even an avatar that's a woman, that's a mom, that's a, a working mom. Cool. Her husband's probably also welcome, right? Their teenage teenage uh, child is also probably welcome, right? But if you spend all of your energy trying to market to all of those different kinds of people, you just won't have enough resources. Yeah, how, how do you, how's that land with you, Danny, as a, as a explanation? No, I think that that's solid and, and spot on because one of the things like I've almost gravitated away from like, think about one person in mm -hmm. your gym who you love or give this avatar a name. Cause that was a big thing. Like you have to name the person and sure. that tends to give the, the lens of which you just described where for the, and, th and that's like the gender thing too is interesting because you nailed it. What I tell people is like, you know, you were looking for all these app qualities in your avatar and nine times out of 10, the husband and the wife, by nature of being husband and wife, fit those all of those qualities, right? Mm -hmm. And there are certain times where the messaging is very specific to gender, but for the most part, you're looking for these broad qualities. And when you and it's, it's and a lot of my parallels go to reading because reading. Um, <laughs> but when you look at like the, what the book is about, there are qualities of the book that attract multiple different types of people. So when you're yeah. speaking to this one quality of your avatar, people who have goals of X and values of Y, that isn't just Mrs. Rossini. It's it's Mrs. Rossini, it's her friend, and those could look like three different demographical pieces of people. Yeah, yeah, one, that's really well said. Um, well, let's switch gears, because I think I feel like we've given people a great um, kind of outline for what an avatar is, why is it, why it's important. I think it'll, we'll probably refer back to it a lot as we go through the other pillars that we identified. But let's talk a little bit about brand. So I'll start with you this time, Anthony. It's like, what, you know, how, how does, what role does brand play in how you organize yourself around your marketing efforts? 
I, th- I think your brand plays plays a huge role. And even in our unicorn society meetings recently, we were talking revisiting core values mm-hmm. and just having a lot of things that if you have a lot of clarity on your brand, like we talked about earlier with your fitness principles and you're talking about, you know, like what your space looks like and how it feels like, what is, you know, the, the, your graphics that you design, are they clean? Are they graffiti style? You know, different, different things that you put out there in terms of like how you clear, have clarity around your brand also helps the type of person or that type of avatar that gets attracted to those types of things. Yeah. Even from color, right? Your colors play a role in terms of the type of person that attracts to blue or red or green and different things like that play a role as well. Yeah. Well said, my friend. I mean, if we think about brand as being like kind of the story people tell about you when you're not in the room, it's it's a combination of all those things, how you make them think, how you make them feel, the visual cues that you give them. Uh, and I, I think you're really smart to bring up values here because ideally your values are articulated and align with this kind of reputation that you're creating. Uh, but how do you think about Two Guns? How do you think about brand as one of the pillars here? Well, I think you um, said one of the things I espouse just a little differently where um, Alex Beaton, she's a social media marketer. Um, her, mm-hmm. She says your, your brand is what your target audience says about you behind your back. Yep. Right. And, and I think that that's kind of the lens of which we look at it. And then we also, we kind of disassociate the verbiage between brand and branding, right? Cause I think the biggest difference is that your brand is happening with or without your active input <laughs> sure. and branding is us working on it. Right. And I think that that's a worthy distinction because people like you have a brand and an essence, whether you know it or not. And mm-hmm. it comes down to certain things. And you guys, as, as Mark Fisher Fitness Unicorns, I like a brand style guide and iconography and all of those things uh, matter immensely. But then all the other things that happen with it, like the avatar and getting all of those pieces into it uh, matter just as much. And we want to actively be working on it, but also that's not to say that it's not happening with or without you. <laughs> yeah. And then um, the other piece is uh, Goodby and Silverstein. Um, they, one of the things they say is that the worst thing your brand can be is invisible. Right. And again, even if you're not working on it, like you're not having the presence is worse mm-hmm. than having one that speaks for you without your input. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, my friend. I think that's really great. And I love that distinction between brand and branding, right? It's like, you know, one is like this, this noun that exists, whether you're contributing to it or not. And, and branding is like this, this action that you're taking to contribute to the story being told. I think it's really useful. So let's just, let's, let's just talk for a minute about kind of the branding part is that, you know, what, what are the things you do when you begin to organize your, your efforts here? What are the things you do to contribute to your branding? We're going to get into creating content in a second. So before we even get to content, what are the other things, the foundational things you do to make sure that your brand is telling the story you want it to? Let's start with you this time, Two Guns. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, we look at the foundation of branding, like your, your name, your logo, your tagline, right? Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's the things that people naturally think about you by default, uh, you know, like results fitness and change the way fitness is done, right? Like they're, they're synonymous with one another. You know what the name says, you know what the tagline means, and ideally mm-hmm. you have a logo that is representative of that. Um, you know, and once we have that foundation, it's what are all of the little things that add up to the big things, right? Because I think um, Andrew Spina of, of FRS, he didn't talk about training, but he talks about like when, when you talk about the sum of all the parts, in the end, all you have are the parts, right? So looking at all those, all those little things that define who, who you are, what you do, what the people say about you behind your back, how they describe you to your friends. It's mm-hmm. hard to put like tangible aspects on, but all those little things, like what is their experience when they first walk in your door? What are the first things they see? And really fine tuning all of those little details that in isolation may not seem to matter that much, mm-hmm. but all fill into the experience that is the experience of you and your gym. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well said. Well, for you, Anthony, what are some of those little things that make up your brand? Like where in your, in your, your whole business, do you plant all those little seeds that, that actually grow your brand? Yeah. I think one of the things we, we started off as a CrossFit gym six years ago now. And one of the things when we rebranded and refocused was telling our, we actually physically like sent out a message of like how, we want our people when they other folks ask them what it is like we 
kind of it described what we do with clarity. So they weren't like, well, it's kind of like CrossFit, but it's not this thing. So even like giving the tools to our, our current clients about how to speak about us to their friends and family. Um, so they had an idea like this is what we do. We, we are no longer doing CrossFit and we do this sort of thing. And, you know, it might look a certain way or, or be this way. So that was one of the things that we've done. Um, I think always we really pride ourselves in like the cleanliness of the gym right? Mm-hmm. And always being clean. So like the, the space is, has a, a certain look about it when you walk in, things are organized and, and things like that, that plays to your brand. Uh, like, so just having that overall, like, like Danny was saying, those really small things that, that will add up to being really big things. Cause the, the, every little interaction and everything counts, whether it's, you know, having toilet paper in the, in the toilet paper dispenser, <laughs> um, having a clean floor and, you know, just how people talk about it outside. And like when nobody's watching, like, like Danny was talking about, and just giving them the tools, um, at least your current members, the tools to be able to articulate that properly, at least the way that you want it to be articulated when you're not around to be able to clarify that for somebody. Yeah, I think that's it's really well said. And I think, you know, one of the tools that I've seen be really useful for people over the last few years is the book story brand, mm-hmm. right? I know they do courses and workshops in there, but if you're, if you know, any of our listeners are like, yeah, I don't know how to be more articulate in explaining to people what we do and what problems we solve, go get that book, right? Go work through some of the story brand exercises because it's one of the best ways I've seen that people can tighten up that story that Anthony's talking about. Um, and also to say this, that um, I think a big part of your brand is how you communicate about yourself. And um, I won't often quote Gary V, but Gary V is sometimes has a lot of wisdom and I don't always, always love, don't always love the, the, um, the, uh, the delivery method, but I, I love the, I love the knowledge. Um, and one of the things I'm paraphrasing, but one of he said recently is that people don't buy the best products or services. They don't buy the, the ones that are the best. They buy the ones that are communicated the best and easiest to understand. And that just really resonated with me because so much what we're talking about here is that if we, the brand really resonates with people, it means it's it's clear that they understand who we serve and how we serve them. And they can even, re, as to your point, Anthony, they can even rearticulate that to their friends, <laughs> right? It makes referrals easy. Right? It makes word, word of mouth easy uh, because part of our brand is it's very easy to understand what we do. Um, and, you know, I, you know, I think that's that's really wise. Uh, what what else matters to you when it comes to brand, Two Guns? I, well, I think one of the things I've been working on with the, the marketing peeps is when you look at like the question is what makes your gym and your brand different from your competitors? Mm-hmm. It's a it's a common question, but you, you have to answer it with the caveat is you have to talk about benefits, not features, and you have to, you can't talk about yourself. You have to do it through the lens of your avatar. Yeah, and now that's actually a useful tool because it's what is the experience of the client that answers that question. Cause and one of the, and you guys know that like one of the things we're constantly working on in our kind of referral marketing is making what we do easy to explain because we have a fairly complicated training system and a very individualized training system that tends to be hard for clients to articulate to their friends mm-hmm. where, you know, we have a pro baseball guy and he's, obviously by nature of being a pro baseball pitcher has pretty complicated stuff. And he's like, my agent and the other players asked me what kind of stuff we did. And I just like, I don't know. And I had to like show them. So it's like, Oh, we really have to hone in on that to make it simple and yep. clear because yeah. again, it, we, we don't want to talk about like, Oh, well we do this, but our super complicated hyper individualized training system matters in application to the person, but not before they know why it matters. Yeah. So having the language of what they're talking about, what is different about you from their perspective that, again, is a benefit and not a feature. Yeah, I love that. I think, you know, for our listeners, can you just kind of unpack features and benefits? It's something that, you know, that marketing folks know the terminology for. But what, what are they? Well, um, so going through the tour of our gym, the feature is we have kettlebells, right? Okay, this is. 2022 uh, hopefully all the gyms have kettlebells so <laughs> not only does it not differentiate you but it's just a feature we have this thing and then the benefit is why does this thing matter to you right mm-hmm. We're like okay so the kettlebell it allows us access to very a handful of very specific exercises that give us these goals which matter in the more metabolic we can make your workouts the more you'll be able to not spend on the sidelines of your kids lives and spend time in the actual game of them. So the benefits are, why does it matter? The feature is, this is the thing. 
Yeah, well said. And I think that's, you know, it's another important piece of this. If you're talking about organizing all of your marketing efforts, <clears throat> you want to make sure that you're able to explain every product and service you offer in the in your client avatar's perspective in terms of features and benefits. I think that piece that Danny mentioned there is so important. It's not what you think, what, why the features and benefits matter to you as a business. <laughs> it has to be from your avatar's perspective. So what do they get? And what do they get out of it? Why does it matter? And I think that that's, that's hard to do, but I think it's really foundational. You can't do any of the rest of the marketing stuff we'll talk about if you're not clear on who the avatar is and what the features and benefits are of what you offer. And spending time working on it, right? Because it's not what comes naturally, right? Mm -hmm. You have to spend time unpacking it. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's switch to our the kind of the third pillar out of the four that we identified here. And um, Anthony, I'll ask you to start with this one if you can, which is just the content creation. So how do you wrap your arms around? How do you plan to and execute doing the work of creating content and putting it out there in the world? What's been your approach? So the, the one of the after you have that avatar kind of client, we've broken down, you know, some of those values and the the pain points that Danny had talked about, then you can start breaking those pain points down into, you know, uh, content creation in terms of, okay, so how do we phrase this, this caption and how do we do these sorts of things? And then once we have those captions, I, you know, idealize, and then we, we go and capture photos and videos of, of folks actually doing the thing in our gym in a way that can articulate them in a safe way. You know, if we're, if we're the, the safe gym, we had this conversation with the, with, a colleague recently, if we're the safe gym, we want to show safe movements and people doing things in a safe way. And then we can articulate that through our, our, our visuals, as well as in our words, in our captions as we go through. Yeah. Yeah. Really well said. Really well said. I think that, you know, that, that these all, all these threads that we're talking about connect here. Uh, and if, you know, if, Technology is kind of part of this pillar here because I think this is a place where people often use a lot of technology. So we'll we'll circle back to that in a second. But what about you, Two Guns? I know you you have a, a lot of strategies you've played around with over the years in terms of how to create content and get it out there. So what's your latest best thinking? Well, I think when we talk about content, I always come back to four or five basics, right? And the, mm -hmm. the first one is you have to have something of which you can capture um the content and Anthony mentioned this as like the, the fourth pillar, right? Mm -hmm. And we talk about it inside this one, but it could very well be its own fourth pillar. But right now, like the cameras, both for photos and videos we have on a current, even two or three year old phone is, is more than enough. But I tell them mm -hmm. like, you have to have a decent phone and that's, we don't have to have this fancy DSLR, all these crazy, you know, cameras yeah. that do all these crazy things, but you do have to have something that, captures quality content you know whether it's one of the newer iphones or even you know the the older your phone is the more it has to be an iphone right but obviously <laughs> and newer androids are sufficient as well um, but you know it, it is isn't that many years ago where you were spending thousands of dollars in, for just a camera that does what your phone does now like the technology mm -hmm. is there so it does it does what you need it to do um the second i tell people is that you know, we, we look at this content piece where the lens of which we have to do, we are a publishing platform and we are content creators, then we are whatever thing we label ourselves as, because that has to be the pillar. You have to get into it. I, I have to always be thinking about and actually creating the content that goes along because we need to do it. And if we don't have that lens, it tends, to, it can't be on the back burner. It has to be like this thing we're doing is either capturing or creating or both content as we go along. Mm. And I think the other kind of um, piece is that there's there's no there's no hacks like there's no shortcuts. It you know we look for this algorithm hack. Like no, it, it literally one the only thing I call it the cockroach of marketing. The one that hasn't changed is that high quality engaging content that is individual to your avatar has always been the marketing answer. The vehicles yeah. of which we get that out there changes almost daily. But that's still the foundation of everything we talk about. And we can't necessarily forget that there, there's no hacks. There's just that that drives all the other things. Um, and then the other one is a elementary level of photography and videography skills, like knowing what the rule of thirds is, knowing how lighting impacts things, and you know, knowing what aspect of video, like what ratios and all these things. Like we have it doesn't you don't have to be even intermediate or, or expert, but you do have to have this elementary level knowledge of it. And then whether it's the fifth or just a plus one to that is a basic level of editing 
skill. Mm-hmm. A symbol, it, it can just be in shot, right? But having a little bit of editing to be able to go through the things, again, you don't have to be an expert, but there does have to be some elementary or basic level of things. And then now we can talk about the actual content, right? <laughs> totally, totally. Well, I think it's a it's a great list to get people started, right? Because you got to have all that foundational stuff. And I love that that idea of like thinking of yourself as kind of like a, a publishing pat- platform, right? That part of your job as a gym is to make sure people see it, what it is you do, right? That's going to be like the lifeblood of getting new people in the door is creating content that connects with them uh, to show that shows them that you could be the their next fitness home, right? You could be there forever a fitness home, but they got to see that before they're willing to give you a chance. And so I think I love that idea of like, you know, putting that first and foremost, because you're right. So many people I talk to, it's totally on the back burner. It's like we create content when we remember to, or when we think about it, or we have a good idea, or you know, once a month when we have that team team in service, you know, which is like you know not wrong, but not the kind of consistent flow we want people to expect from us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If, if, so if the only time you get testimonial content from your clients is when they mm-hmm. randomly, unprompted, tell you something. Yeah, you've yeah, waited too long. You're not doing long. it wrong, but you're not doing it right either. <laughs> you've you've waited too long. Yeah. So I mean, when you have all all this in place and you have some basic skills and you're ready to create some content, Anthony, how do you organize all that effort between you and your team? How do you get clear on what needs to get done and when? Like, you know, how do you how do you structure it all? Yeah. So we have a, a Google Sheet that we share um, that has all those captions of those those pain points and those problems and how we how we work through it, and then just creating a calendar of like you know like this piece of, of content goes here with this visual and, and so on and so forth. And then bop it back and forth through Instagram and Facebook because people are on different platforms, right? You might have a little bit of younger crowd on Instagram, a little bit older on Facebook. So, you know, and one of my good friends uh, who does some marketing on social media, it's just like once is never right. So if they, even if they see it once it's, or if you post it once, like most people don't see your stuff anyway. So you can repeat things a lot. And not really, it might feel redundant or repetitive to you, but it's not going to feel that to the people who are on your platform or looking on you on Instagram or Facebook because they're not seeing everything that you're posting. So you can get that schedule going. And we use a platform called Later, which allows us to schedule it. And you could see kind of what your feed looks like and it auto posts it for you. So instead of like doing it when you remember to, it's seven o'clock at night and like, oh, I forgot to post something. You can schedule it out for the month, for the week in advance, like on a, on a you know, Friday, do the next week and everything is just set it and it's good to go. You can do captions or, or hashtags in there and all those different things. And then you have that consistency uh, that Michael was talking about, because if you can have that consistency and you keep hitting it over and over again, that's where you're going to start getting some traction with getting uh, people to recognize you and see what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. And then how does, who does this work on your team? How does the work get divided for you specifically? For specifically, we have somebody who who I, I hired, I'm kind of like very lucky, a college student who was super into photography. And I had her come down and, and try some stuff out and just take pictures of things. And, and we had a comp, like, I think we had like a little fundraising competition that she came and started. And then we brought her on and she ended up taking over like all those those photo video things like we do photo shoots uh, once a quarter and she does all that stuff. And then she, we get together with what the captions are going to look like and how things are going to pair up. But once it comes to actually doing the thing, she does all of that. That's great. Yeah. Good for you. I think when you can find someone who to Danny's point earlier has those foundational, even, even intermediate skills when it comes to photography, editing, et cetera. And these days, you know, you can get a lot of virtual assistance for a lot of this sort of thing, or at least online help (laughs) through places like Upwork and Fiverr. But the fact that you have someone that's physically there that can come in and do video and photos with you is amazing. Yeah, that's Um, great. Yeah. What about you two guns? How's this information? How's this get organized in the, in, in the work? I think it's one of the things in talking with gym owners about their marketing, there seems to be an element that whether it's not possible, you have a hard time completely delegating it where Mm. the, you know, the owner has to have some it or maybe a little more than some input into the content creation, the marketing things, because there's, there's some elements that are unique to what you do and that is best done through you and by proxy hard to delegate. So in looking at it, the workflow kind of depends, right? I think it comes back to, and we talked about this a little earlier, maybe it was even before the call formally started, where there has to be pieces that um, when we're looking at what what we're creating and how we create it is not a, about a platform that we tend to gravitate towards, 
right? It's about what platform is our avatar on. Mm -hmm. And the platform that our avatar is on is by nature then dictates what content we put out and how, right? Because you, yep. you tend to, like the people who really hone in on Instagram for females 45 and 50 and up tend to be people who love Instagram, but females 45 and 50 and up are still primarily on Facebook. So you can spend time on Instagram, but you have to spend a lot of time on Facebook and the way you market on Facebook and the way you market on Instagram are not the same, even though it's all Facebook Inc. Right. Yeah. So when we look at like, what, what does this workflow look like? The first question is where does this workflow go? Sure. Yeah. I think that's a great way of thinking about it. And you're almost, what you're saying here is, you know, reverse engineering from your avatar, you know, where are their eyeballs, not only what platform are their eyeballs on, but how are they using it? <laughs> right. Cause even when you talk about those two places like Facebook and Instagram, there's different ways of using it, right? If people go in there for swipe through things that are informational and educational. People go in there for just stories. They're looking for reels. Are they on Facebook because they're in groups? And they like to chat with people in community settings. And so even under those two giant umbrellas of Facebook and Instagram, there's all these different ways that your avatar might engage with those platforms. Um, and then asking the same question um, I asked Anthony, Danny, for you, you know, how does the work get done? I know you actually like doing a lot of it yourself, but in terms of other clients you're working with, how do you see the work getting organized in small training gyms? Yeah, <laughs> with trying not to give like the, mm. the junk generic answer, but it depends on how involved and interested the owner is, you know, talking mm -hmm. to the Bobby Kelly's of the world who you, you can't pay him to do this kind of stuff. He, we have, he has to have a person who he delegates it to versus, you know, the Matt Casey's of the world who actually enjoy the actual acquisition and creating of the content. So yeah. the, again, it comes back to what, what, what interest does the owner have? Is it like negative? right is it but and most of the time it falls in the middle but re, again reverse engineering the workflow to what is on whose plate right because mm -hmm. some people in the beginning at least you can't afford to delegate it so you have to do a certain amount of it but then the goal may be to delegate as quickly as possible but then the, the more that gets delegated the more all the little things have to be honed in and it is more often than not, those little things are not honed in enough for people to delegate it well, which is why I come back to like the owner has to be involved in it more than they typically want to be because you have to be dialing in these things and putting all of those little yeah. touches and this brand stuff and yeah, it's that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. So I think, you know, for listeners, I think it's a great thing for you to get in touch with that if you are listening and you are the owner founder of your business to get honest with yourself about how much you like doing this. <laughs> how fun is it for you to be involved in it? There's some pieces you'll have to be involved with, to Danny's point, until it is delegatable, until it is dialed in and structured enough to be able to be hand-offable. But that might not be for a while for some of you. And some of you might love it and might want to always do a big part of it forever. Um, I know we're going to run out of time soon. So I want to switch gears briefly because so much of our conversation right now, actually all of our conversation right now, has been based on about digital marketing but getting the word out and, and spreading the word about your brand on digital means, you know, does this, what changes when we think about marketing in non-digital ways, <laughs> when we think about going out into our communities and setting up tables at farmer's markets or building partnerships with other local businesses, or we think about doing actual print ads in our local publications or billboards in our communities, you know, is there anything about what we've said today that changes when you think about non-digital marketing? How about you, Anthony? I don't think much changes. I mean, your graphics and your visuals are going to be similar and comparable um, through digital marketing and, and through, you know, hand, paper and pen type stuff. I think how you present yourself out in the public, um, just like it would if somebody's walking into your gym, I think your branding in that sense and how you articulate things. And, you know, I think, I don't know if it was, it was you, Michael, or, or Mark, but like if you confuse, you lose type idea. So if you mm -hmm. can articulate yourself and, and be clear in what you're trying to say when you're talking to folks or whatever offer you're trying to offer when you're making those or building those relationships with local businesses, I think the more clear you, clarity you can have around what you do and how you can help and how you guys can create value with each other, I think would be is the, the most beneficial. And it's the same across all platforms, whether in person or through digital means, I, I believe. 
Yeah, I think it's really well said, Anthony. So if you're going to be in person and your primary way of getting people to know you is some sort of face-to-face or real life in, in the real world interactions, you got to get really good about explaining yourself in conversation, right? Really good at explaining yourself in in print media, right? Where there's no video allowed. You know? yeah. that I, And that requires a, a level of succinctness that I think is even more rigorous than in other platforms. What about you, Two Guns? How do you think about this? Yeah, I, I think a lot of what we've talked about so far is not digital or exclusive to digital. We use them as examples a little bit, but you know who you're talking to, the avatar, your, your brand, um, how you're creating content, what makes for engaging content, what makes for high quality copy, that it's not actual platform or media specific. It, the rules go along. Digital tends and still is the way that most people will typically answer a call to action second or above like actual referral in person client to cl- client to future client uh, mm-hmm. but all of the all of the rules are still the rules for marketing it just so happens that digital is where they will tend to answer the things and we yeah. talk a lot about now is like the marketing ecosystem where we notice um, a lot of times when because people answering calls to actions on ads on social has gone down for multiple reasons. It's, but it's still the best way and it is a pain in the ass to track. But one of the things is that when people are not running call to action ads, global leads are down. And when they are global leads are up and Oh, my ads aren't working. It's like, well, they might not be going through that very specific funnel that you're putting out there, but that doesn't mean it's not working. It just is working in a roundabout way. And people don't like that, right? Because it's hard to track. And like, no, I need to know that this thing and this thing goes here. It yep. gets me this. And it's like, well, it really, to a point, it'd be nice, right? And we try to do it, but it just doesn't necessarily work that way, right? Here's our global spend. Here's our global leads and fine tuning things. And again, the better you manage overall, the better you can fine tune those things. So now, okay, these ads are not getting a lot of traction in terms of people answering the call to action to this specific funnel. But when I'm not running them, my, lead, my leads are down by 30%. So they're yeah. working, right? It yeah. doesn't matter if people aren't answering, they're working. Yeah, 100%. I think that's exactly it. And it's a hard concept for people to wrap their brains around, you know, and we can probably have another podcast on those kinds of strategies. I mean, an analogy I'll use is like if, you know, if I went to a bunch of parties because I wanted to make new friends <laughs> and I go to these parties and I'm hoping that I make new friends by having people I met text me. And the following week after I went to three parties, no one texted me does not necessarily mean I didn't make any good connections and new friends, <laughs> right? I was kind of maybe a weird analogy for this, but the same thing is true. It's no, because, that's perfect. Yeah, because, because you know, I'm putting myself out there, my brand out there, I'm building reputation for what we do and how we take care of people. But because they didn't take these specific steps does not mean they're not listening and seeing it. Um, so I think it's important for people to hear that, Danny. Um, all right. I know we're going to, we're going to run out of time and we've, We've had this is a, a long one. I thought we were going to be shorter than this. We had so much to say, friends, which I'm so excited about. But um, I let's say do this. nothing short. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, let's do this. Let's just wrap up with some quick tips. So I, this is a question I, I like to ask at the end of these, which is for all of our listeners out there who are like, yeah, you all just listed a lot of shit to do. <laughs> you just gave me a big, long laundry list of stuff I could think about and do. And there might be people listening who haven't really started doing any of this yet in a structured way. So if you're in their shoes or and you're in our dear listener shoes who just is like, okay, well, I haven't begun to organize myself around marketing at all. Where do you start, Anthony? What's your first step if you were to approach this all for the first time? I think getting like, like we've talked about a lot, getting clear on the avatar, but also um, what would be helpful. And I know Danny was talking about this a little bit, but know where you're marketing because how, you know, even like the, the size of the graphics and little things like that, that come out on Facebook or Instagram, you know, like look, you can Google those, right. And having some clarity or using a platform like Canva, I think just getting some familiarity with what actually, what things look like, or even following some places that you, um, know that do marketing very well and kind of mm. get some ideas from them and how their things look and things that attract that you're attracted to yeah. uh, as a potential client. And then maybe that might be similar to what style you start to in, embody um, in terms of creating your own content and then getting really familiar with the different ways that you can showcase those things on the different platforms. You know, like in Facebook, you should put the link at the bottom and have all these different things and the graphics have to, should look a certain way or be a certain size. Otherwise your, your words get cropped out. 
and things like that that happen. And when potential clients are looking at them, they look kind of unprofessional because you have things that are cut up and you can't see. And just having some clarity on on those mm. things um, to be able to ha- show um, what it is. I guess to summarize that is to find things that you really like and what what things look good to you. And then yeah. also just be a student on what the the platforms and how they're supposed to look to make it, your message as clear as possible. Yeah, I love that suggestion, Anthony. I mean, you mentioned Avatar, which I'm sure we all can agree is definitely one of the first steps. But then getting just following some people that inspire you, that you think your maybe your avatar might also be inspired by, and just to understand how the content gets delivered, right? What the final product looks like. And what comes to mind is the idea of like having the end in mind. Right. The first step here is to get a little bit of a picture for what does the end look like? What's the what's the goal? Um, and so I love that idea. Go follow 10 people that you're inspired by and you like how they how they do marketing. Yeah. What about you, Danny? Where do you start if you're doing this from square one? Yeah. And I think it's, it's one of those things like you're you're not allowed to say it if it's what you do, but you have to get out of the thing that you're, you don't have to invest in some capacity in learning how to do this. Mm-hmm. Right. Like you have there's we by nature, we are trainers, we are workout nerdy nerds, right? Marketing, it very rarely comes, you know, or not it doesn't come by nature to most of us. And the people who it does tend to not be great fitness people. So by inherently, we being good fitness people means marketing is not a strong suit. And to think you should just be able to do it and just know how to do it by flying by the seat of your pants. Is, is a fool's propositions. You need to actually invest in, and again, it doesn't mean you have to pay agencies thousands of dollars to run your ads. For most people paying agencies thousands of dollars a month to run their ads is a horrible idea, yeah. right? Because they don't have all those foundational things, but you have to invest both your time, energy, resources, all the things in learning how to do it because there's a lot of pieces to it. And most of us do not spend the time to actually, or, mm-hmm. or the desire to even, you know, let alone actually do it, but actually want to do it, right? Yeah, that's it, my friends. I think those those two pieces of advice are great for our listeners. Like number one, get out of the idea that you don't need to spend time on marketing, right? That's going to magically happen someday. Just like learning anything new, you got to put the time in, you got to put the effort in. Uh, even if you're not going to do it long-term, you should at least know enough know enough that you know how to hire someone to do it for you and what you want from someone in that job. And so I think that's a really great start is work on your mindset first. (laughs) And then number two, I love Anthony's suggestion here is then go start to find what inspires you. What kind of content out there really lights you up? Follow people who you think are doing it well. So you can have a picture of maybe what you want to do. I think those are, those are great tips. I I think I'm a, I'm also the, I'll add one more which is, I think you should have a lot of conversations with people who you think are your avatar, <clears throat> right? Go talk to your favorite clients and get to know more about them. Like I said before, take them all to coffee, take them all to lunch, <laughs> right? Whatever it is and get in their heads, learn a little bit about how they spend their lives in your community. Where are their eyeballs? Where are they shopping? Where do their friends go? What platforms do they use and how do they use them? Why, why do they pick your gym over the other gyms? What are the ones that they try? I mean, all that information is so critical to getting started um, and can be fun to learn that information. What are you going to say, Danny? Uh, no, I was going to say it's plus one to that. So spending time seeing what your clients or and especially the clients you like do in their spare time mm-hmm. is a very valuable use of your time because that's that's competition with you. Like what yeah. they do in their spare time, even if it's not fitness. And knowing that is again, because like the Homer Simpson, like we make assumptions Right, but actually asking the clients like what they do in their spare time, yeah. paying attention when they're talking about it, will help you immensely. Yeah, I love that. And you know, I say all the time, like you don't have to make assumptions when you're basing your avatar off real people you've trained in real life. Just go talk to them. They're happy to talk to you. They probably want to have lunch with you. They would love for you to 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 ask these questions. Most of them. Um, so yeah, great conversation, gents. Let's wrap things up. So if people want to learn more about you or follow you on the social medias or go learn more about your gyms, uh, where can they find you, friends? How about you, Anthony? Uh, our gym is at Prime. Uh, MVMNT on all the platforms. Um, so we have Instagram, Facebook, all that kind of stuff. And I personally do like a lot, a lot of my own different things too, uh, at a Mercurio on Instagram and Amazing. mostly Instagram. Yeah. Amazing. What about you, Danny? Um, it's Danny two guns on Facebook at Danny two guns and at two guns does books on Instagram. Uh, those <laughs> are the three easiest places to find me. 
Amazing. We'll put all those links in the show notes down below and uh, at businessunicorns.com slash podcast. Well, thanks for doing this, gents. Listeners, if this was fun for you, please share, comment below, subscribe. What did, what value did you get out of this conversation? What kind of conversations do you want to have us um, talk about next in this roundtable format or in any format? Um, and thanks to you, Anthony and Danny, for doing this. I really appreciate you both doing it. And uh, let's have some more chats again soon. Yeah, thank you. Always love to give back to the unicorn. <laughs> Well, I hope you love today's podcast and forgive me. I want to remind you one more time, if you haven't already done so, head over to businessunicorns.com, click the button and get your free self-assessment, the ultimate training gym owner report card. I promise you, you're going to want to dig into this resource and get the support you need, finding crystal clarity on exactly where you need to be focusing to create a life and a business you love.